I'd now like to, uh, to ask the, uh, the panel to, uh, to move forward and, uh, and take their seats with me. As they move up, I'll give a quick uh, background brief as to each of, the, uh, each of the members. So, in alphabetical order, Khal Major Khaled Al Khalidi uh, is currently a student at, uh, at Australian Commander Staff College. He's a former operations officer from one regiment. He's had former operational deployments as an artillery troop commander on Operation Herrick in Helmand in 2009 and as a joint fires observer for Op Slipper in Aruzgan in 2011. Warren Officer Sean Graham is beside him. He's a former regimental sergeant major of 23 Regiment, RAA, and the master gunner of 2nd Division. He's had former operational deployments with Op Mazurka in, in the Sinai in 2001 as Battery Sergeant Major of 105 Battery for Op Astute in Timor-Leste in 2006, as Troop Sergeant Major for Op Herrick in Helmand in 2008, and as an RSM with the Artillery Training Team Kabul Op Slipper in 2011. In the middle, we're joined by Dr Malia Hampton. Mel is a historian in the military history section of the Australian War Memorial. Her doctoral thesis was on the battles of Pozier and Mouquet Farm, her primary interest is in the operational conduct of the First World War, particularly the Western Front. In 2016, Malia published her seminal work, Attack on the Somme, the First Anzac Corps and the Battle of Pozier Ridge in 1916. On the left is uh, Brigadier Ben James. And ben is the Director General, Training and Doctrine Command. The former commander of one brigade, former DG Modernisation and Project for Land 400. His former operational deployments include as a military observer with UNSO, three tours in East Timor, including his commander to Timor Les Battle Group, three in 2007-2008, and also as a deputy commander of Combined Team Aruzgan in 2012. Our final panel member is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Langford. Andrew is currently the Staff Officer Grade 1 Joint Fires Army in Army Headquarters. He's a former commanding officer of Joint Proof and Experimental Unit, and he's had a former operational deployment as the Operations Analyst Lead within Headquarters JTF-633 in 2012-2013. So at this stage, uh, ladies and gentlemen, what I'd like to do is uh, give, the, uh, give the panel members an opportunity to, uh, to make any comments that they would like. But then after that, what I'd like to do is to transition into a, uh, a dialogue between between uh, these subject matter experts and you, the audience, who are, I consider, the near peers in, regard, in relation to being practitioner experts, historian experts, and, and academic experts as well. So I welcome this as a, as a dialogue between everybody, but I'd like to first give over the, uh, the floor uh, to, our, uh, to our panel members first. Hello everyone, Major Khaled of um, I'd first like to touch on uh, Adam Rankin's brief about the improvements in prediction uh, from the, especially the end of World War I, and say that even though a lot of things have changed, based on our super experience myself and uh, Sean Grahams, a lot of things have stayed the same in that. Um, on operations at uh, Afghanistan 2009 with British light guns, uh, every member of the troop, specifically myself and Sean, primary responsibility for solving the Gallery problem. And we were doing everything possible uh, in accordance really with the same principles that were developed in World War I uh, to be as accurate as possible. So that hasn't changed. Thanks, Floyd. Um, for those who don't know me, Sean Graham. Um, I've been out of the Army a couple of years now. Um, but thank you very much to Colonel Ford for the uh, invitation to come down. Um, I really appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, from the, especially the first brief, uh, the gunnery problem still exists, and although we've come pretty close to cracking it uh, on a consistent basis, it still comes back to bite you. And one, one uh, example I'll give you is uh, just about 95% uh, of all guns in Helmand Province went down over a couple of day period. All the sites shut down, GPS shut down, nobody could fire. Uh, they started bringing sites in under 24 hours from the UK and they sent that part of the gunnery problem back to some boffins 
um, at various establishments in the UK and solved it within about 36 hours. And it was quite a simple solution, but it did, that gunnery problem came back to bite us and uh, yeah, it could have got very dangerous. And the other point that I saw in the first one uh, was the, uh, the dedication that uh, Fourth Army was putting into the counter battery fire. We did put a lot of effort into counter battery fire uh, in Helmand Province um, in terms of if any indirect or rocket uh, appeared, uh, we would go to great lengths um, in terms of trying to destroy uh, those assets um, because of the damage they were doing to, uh, to friendly forces. Um, when we first started with our counter battery, uh, we were an absolute disgrace. Um, and as we progressed uh, through the time, um, our response time, our system got a lot better um, to the point that uh, we were able to, uh, to uh, have a good crack at getting the mortars and rockets. Thank you. Speak with a common voice. You can you can tell where they're going 
in the future with their trades, with their training, uh, as opposed to those who, who don't do that quite as well. So, so well done for a fantastic contribution, mate. And uh, I, I just think this seminar and the support you've had here from, uh, from an enormous amount of experience. Uh, uh, those who have gone before us, historians like Roger Lee, of course, contemporary uh, gunners that have got on the stage here, I just think it's fantastic. So keep going. Uh, when Nick asked me to come along for, to, to speak here, uh, I, I did a little bit of, had an opportunity to do a little bit of research at the, at the War Memorial. And for me, in terms of taking lessons from this particular seminar, and I think seminars previously as well, you, you get drawn to that extraordinary uh, painting by Will Longstaff. It's actually called The Breaking of the Hindenburg Line. Uh, uh, a great piece of canvas, Mark Five tanks emerging out of the, the shattered spires behind, behind the town. Uh, diggers standing amongst casualties, amongst captured prisoners, so that sense of, of confusion about what would happen in the close fight. Of course, breaking on the on the on the high ground on the on the, on the back of the canvas, you know, the, the, the guns clearly firing in support. You really do get a sense of what that is all about. That combined arm sense of, of what needed to happen at a critical juncture uh, in the First World War at the end of 1918, as they sought to close that close the entire war before the onset of winter and, and get on with that. So that, that painting to me captures a lot of the lessons that we've spoken about and need to be drawn out in a you know. In in a seven hour speaks about breaking of the Hindenburg line. Uh, like our uh, young veterans here, I'd also draw the point uh, talking about lessons of not so much what is changing, although we are absolutely in a period of change and uh, not, not too many calls at, at the centre of more than artillery, what's coming up, but also what stays the same. And when you think about the state of the Australian Corps when they were fighting uh, to break the Hindenburg line, late September, early October, fighting for about six months straight all the way from Hamill through some really substantial battles and some commentary from from uh, Mon Ash and his, his senior leaders that we heard, we heard today and some of the presentations from, from Jason uh, as well uh, about just how much fatigue was setting in, how tired they were and just that, that really important quality of resilience and being able to fight through at a really key juncture of, of, uh, of a war of that scale. So enormous fatigue, enormous numbers of casualties churned out since the Battle of Amiens only two months, I think, before uh, the breaking of the Hindenburg Line. So those qualities, the, the, the calibre of the people that were, that were, that were, that were called upon to, to, to take this action, just simply uh, extraordinary in my view. The other key lesson, of course, again, we learn this year in, year out, uh, is integration, of course, with our, our key coalition partners. I think Jason referred to the presence of the uh, American Second Corps fighting under Monash at the, at, the, at the breaking of the Hindenburg line. Uh, certainly energetic, uh, certainly brought a lot of horsepower to the fight, not a lot of experience. So uh, uh, Mike Nyberg, uh, uh, an amazing US historian specialising in the First World War, a lecturer of mine at the United States Army War College, uh, an enormous source of information on this, writes about Monash, recognising that, certainly appreciating the Americans fighting side by side. But every US company having an Australian senior NCO or officer uh, in, in, in their line to, to, to make sure uh, uh, they knew what was about to uh, occur, improve that liaison and communication and coordination between the two uh, nationalities, and of course, uh, Second Corps primarily, US Second Corps primarily focused on some of the initial objectives breaking into the Hindenburg line, which the Australians then, Australians then supported through to get on with that. So that coalition interoperability how you affect that, the importance of liaison officers, what you ask your uh, less experienced coalition partners to do. Again, lessons that we learn uh, year and year again. I'm sure we'll learn it again next year when we uh, see our American friends over here for, for things like health and Sable as well. So yes, we are in a substantial period of change. Uh, the more things change, the more they say the same. I think some of those lessons that were drawn out are really important for us to reflect on as well. So uh, great seminar, great initiative, Nick. Look forward to the questions. Thanks, sir. Um, now that we're clearly uh, turned all over to, uh, to the audience, uh, we've got a pretty good uh, repertoire of, uh, of uh, experts here. So, can I ask uh, the audience to uh, ask a question or venture an opinion from one of our heard today or uh, something you've heard from one of the previous seminars so far? Thank you.
close to organize the night and support it. And I just at the, at the, in the panel's view, is that the most um, leading example of the German action or a German uh, development or technology or, or a tactic that caused the, the greatest change to the use of Allied in the First World War, but that they impact anything at all. Thank you. Probably for that first, I think. But also, it really helps to say that historians out there in the audience as well, if you'd like to go to the door of Rome, and please do as well. Um, the short answer actually is um, trying to help make the British. The, the formation of the trench lines on the Western Front are actually a problem that takes years to come through. And they are the big, the fact that the um, British and French infantry aren't able to flank their, their opponents like they were expected to do is not something anyone had prepared for and that is what dealing with that situation that lack of movement is what the, what the artillery are dealing with all through 1916 all through 1917 and into 1918 so all the germans had to do was come in and keep in, in trenches and they are in foreign territory and technically won quite a bit of ground including some really great coal mines and they don't need to do any more and it's the onus is on the allies to dig them out the, the way they start with their artillery is really um, rudimentary. They, they fight over which battery gets the tree so that their observer can see what's going on. And it becomes more and more sophisticated as time goes on. But that, the level of sophistication that builds up is one that has taken years of constant attention. And aside from conducting immediate counterattacks and a major operation that they're done, the Germans don't do anything. They're doing full scale rail upgrades. They're doing a lot of stuff that goes on, which is against, you know, using forts and quite different warfare. And then until the spring offensive in 1918, they don't have to do anything because they're safe in France and they're safe in the To continue on then, when the Germans do do something in early 1918, and they are using a lot of artillery, but what they are using more importantly are their men. They haven't been doing these big attempts to move that the British and the French have been doing. They're attempting to push the line, and originally they're attempting to bust the line open and pour you men through and fight people. They learn that that's not feasible, the line is 10 miles deep. So they're learning to push the line and, and push you way in and stop and push you way in. They're learning different approaches. The Germans aren't, and they're still thinking we've got to bust our way through, and we're going to get to Paris, and we're going to win the war. So they throw all of them where they have small troops, they are, they are manpower centric and focused on reinstating more movement. And if you contrast that with the effects of that one war from Amiens onwards, pushing, stop, get set, push, stop, get set, push, they never break through, they never try to break through, but they are quite prepared with the liberal application of American infantry to push the Germans that back to Berlin, and, and that's the difference. So, in short, in fringes, in long, two very different parts. Anyone else like to uh, contribute to it as well? I think it's a good right question. Um, so they can supply a 
specific solution to a specific military problem. And where I sit, I think that's far and away the biggest achievement of the Allied arms. The French are the same, the Germans are the same, for exactly the reasons we said. Um, I'd just like to offer a comment on the leader, uh, saying that the, the Germans didn't adopt this uh, right and roll or right push thing. And the reason, in my mind, the reason they didn't do that is they couldn't do that because they had neither the manpower nor the industrial resource to resort to that sort of battle. They had to break through. They had to achieve a strategic result or fail. And they failed, obviously, but they, uh, if you read um, Colonel Bushnell's book, he talks about breakthrough battles, and he criticises critiques of his tactics by saying, we could not adopt right and hold. We did not have the resources. We had to break through. We had to achieve a strategic result. And in a sense, the, the sort of blitzkrieg tactic adopted by another war later is the same thinking applied on all those to go. Uh, that's really interesting, because that's one of those situations where they are saying one thing and they're doing another. Like, we're done, yeah. we're going to be the French right, but we just want to take that ground over there and advance over there. And, you know, they're saying one thing and they're doing another. Um, he's, he's saying they don't have the resources to do it, but someone is throwing resources at small scale counterattacks on a daily basis and ants in the field. If they had stopped and recessed slowly, they could have a rifle. Um, I wouldn't believe him. <laughs> but maybe not on the scale that the Allies could do in, in 1980. But if you put the resources that they put into their daily counterattacks on a 2040 mile front, they could have done anything. They just couldn't have done it at all. But we might have to <laughs> Perhaps it will listen to every commander and staff officer out there that can do anything as long as your priorities are all up. Can I tempt anybody for another question? Yeah, I think we've got time for one question. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Major James Casey. I work uh, across at Russell. Um, my question is for virtually all of the panel. Currently, in the way that we train our young combat war officers, artillerymen in particular, our regimental training stops at, for young officers, the junior to mid captain level. And for our warrant officers, the sub call for warrant officer, where they're dealing really with the regimental environment, and for the officers, they begin exposure to their operations uh, as an operations officer in a brigade. Given that we're reinvigorating the joint task force at the divisional level and how it is that that plugs into American wars, for example. Do we consider that that's appropriate for where we sit now? Or do we think that there's perhaps an opportunity using media like Moodle, for example, for us to continue to develop that? And I'm interested, Khalid, in your perspectives from the Star College and, and sir, uh, from your experience as project. Okay, so I see you're talking about some kind of course prior to actually command operations officer, uh, similar to the old BC course many years ago. Um, well, I'm not, I, I agree with you uh, in part because you know, every combat brigade is in a different cycle. Not all operations officers and battery commanders get a chance to uh, work at that high level. You know, uh, some get an opportunity to do the advanced warfighter in uh, the States, work. Australian brigade with a US division that achieved that exposure to core level targeting, regional level targeting wars and all that, some don't. So uh, potentially some kind of exposure or course uh, that senior captain or junior major level, that um, that core or sort of US style uh, mission headquarters. There we go, James. It's, it's a really good question. I, 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 the first comment that I'd offer is, I, I, I just, I wouldn't be wedded to uh, the only training we do occurs in, a, in our schoolhouse. I think the learning and your, your growth and your opportunities 
In fact, in a lot of ways, happened well outside the schoolhouse. And what, our, what we're asking our brigades to do now, what they're exposed to, not just through Hamels and Talbot cycles, but pretty routinely through the training year, is a absolutely at, at the centre of the training, the experience, and the education, and the growth that we're, that we're talking about. So, so don't don't limit your thinking and your and your and your uh, understanding of how we train and develop our officers to that. Um, there, there's a whole lot more that goes on. There's a whole lot more to come to. I think. I think when we uh, see what the team uh, are turning their mind to uh, in. Uh, accelerated warfare in where the chief sees the army going, the role of army um, cooperation, competition, conflict, persistence, lethality, th those things go to the core of army. They, in a lot of ways they go to the core of artillery corps. So I think the opportunity to learn to grow absolutely outside the schoolhouse. Uh, I would absolutely take that question you posed as you turn your mind to your employment category of views, what we ask the court to do with different ranks and feed that into it. Uh, we are, uh, we are uh, army and it manifests itself in, our, in the trade of organisation. We are wrestling with systems how, uh, that, that try to change our workforce, our trades, our skills that are designed for an army in greens and SLRs and 77 sets. And almost every part of our army now is, is going through such a fast turn uh, of what we're asking our people to do, our course to deliver, our trades to deliver. We just can't keep up with that formal sense of, of changing those trades and structures. So when you're head of core and you, you get together for your core conferences and turn their mind to those employment category review changes, pack that question in there and think critically about what sort of training we want to be able to do. But the third area I'd say is, is again about thinking about some of those trades and our training is uh, again, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of calls that are probably going to be deeply affected by this. Artillery is probably one of them. Our relationship with the industry. I think what we're going to see turned up uh, in uh, 1907 Bravo, we, uh, Army will move into integrated air missile defence for the first time. This is not mutual land warfare. This is probably in the next uh, eight months or so. We'll, we'll have a pretty good idea of what the solution to that is going to be. And it's probably going to be. Uh, 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 it, it, it's, it's going to be a great uh, outcome, a great solution for it. I have the great privilege of getting up and uh, catching up with 16 Air Land Regiment at Delamere earlier in the year. Some uh, amazingly bright uh, young soldiers already immersed in some of the radar technology that the CEA is talking about, already asking to go and do industry placements to understand that technology, te technology how it can best be applied. And we, we heard lessons about harnessing technology and adapting in some of the presentations we had here today. So I would be pushing into those areas in terms of our learning and our training and our understanding, as well as our courses that are that are good, and we're trying to change those. COAC right now is, is rolling out for the first time uh, BMS, so that we, our schoolhouses are, are trying to fight, plan and fight the way we, we do in brigade. So it takes time, it takes bandwidth, it takes money, um, and, and we're not really blessed with those in, in most parts of Army at the moment. So. Think widely, get involved in those employment category reviews, what our trade structures are, and how we how we train people to get there. Um, it's going to be a pretty substantial period of change. Yeah. Uh, just to add to that too, James, uh, while well, they're limited in terms of they're not formal exchanges, but exposure for our officers to some of these activities, uh, we had just sent also for reg over for a future joint warfare planning activity over in the US. Uh, so he's come back with that experience and we hope that he'll also pass that through the regiment. Uh, we're just gearing up for a series of you might have heard or some of the audience might have heard of uh, bulk quest. Um, so previous bulk quest, uh, we've had quite a significant um, delegation from 16 ALR attend that. Uh, next year, bulk quest 19-1 will be in Finland. Uh, and it will be quite a significant yes. Uh, it will be quite a significant presence that we have at that as well. Uh, we're also looking at uh, formal, more formal exchanges uh, through the Centre of Excellence at Fort Sill, uh, with attendance uh, on the course there. And one of that, uh, one of the opportunities we're looking at there is for master guns, CB sergeants, and that kind of thing to the old team courses there, again, to be able to bring back some of that experience. So while that is more formal, it's very much under that exchange umbrella, and that's, an, and that's something that we're exploring with as G at the moment. So while there, it, unfortunately, there's not enough of that to go around to everybody, 
Uh, we're always constantly looking for those type of opportunities uh, where formal training ends to try and build up on through experience. Can I just have a crack at answering that as well too? Uh, James, it's a great question. It's exactly the same question I asked uh, down at the School of Artillery a week ago for a combined gathering of uh, ROGS Force, COAC and uh, Joint Fire uh, KFT Commanders Force uh, body. And it's the thing that concerns me the most as, as head of Britain, I must say. And notwithstanding the comments made by the panel um, about all these other opportunities that are out there. They are excellent opportunities and they're opportunities that perhaps uh, we didn't enjoy quite the same way in the past. Although I do recall as a young lieutenant going and doing uh, exercises in Hawaii and all of those kinds of, kinds of things. But the opportunities we do, we do get now are great. But I am concerned there is not a specific course anymore that delivers what we need for officers to be able to in the other way to function at the divisional and above them. And it's a bit hit and miss. We've got some guys that have gone across and done things in sea flicks and other places on operations and they've acquitted themselves very, very well. But I spent, uh, I spent a month on the Korean Peninsula earlier this year where we were manoeuvring nothing less than a division and in most days we were manoeuvring calls. And there is a real art to managing the indirect fire and the, uh, you know, the SDA um, conundrum in that kind of environment. And uh, you know, my, my view is I think uh, we need to take a long, hard look at the co um, which I think we've, we've, uh, we've created a situation where we become, become combined arms officers uh, and not enough specialists in our own core or our own, our own environment with the ability to understand how that contributes to the combined arms effect and how to work with the other So I think that's, that is the concern I have and I know, you know Ben and I have spoken about this before and we, we can fix it, but, uh, but the, bottom, the, the bottom line is, you know, I don't think we are preparing our battery commanders correctly anymore. And certainly above that, I don't think we are preparing people to do COs. If they're going to be plugged in as a regimental commander inside a US division, inside a ROC US core. Solve the gunnery problem permanently. You know, it's always in motion. 
So you've got to keep working at it and you can't just solve it and then move on. You've got to keep revisiting it. So all of those things. So Matt, now I am really concerned. I mean, it's the first I heard the story there from uh, Troy about the GPS going down in Hillman Province and the fact that the guns were all down for sort of 96 hours. You know, that should have been solvable then and there on the spot with redundant systems. So how do we, how do we cope in, in the future? You know, my day job is the Director of General Plans at Joint Russia's Command. So I think about the world and how we might fight in that world. And the things that concern me are how do you fight in a contested electromagnetic spectrum environment? How do, you, how, do you, how do you do it when GPS is the way? How do you do it when all your systems are cyber attacked? And so that's what worries me. The systems that we use take so much time to train that there's not enough time left to train a redundant system and they're very complex. So they are the challenges we face, but you know, MET, survey, those sorts of things from the you know, First World War, you know, we're really learning those lessons and reapplying them uh, in the original study. Just, just to add to that, so uh, it's that corporate knowledge that as we get new technology, which takes more time to train on, that we potentially have a risk of losing. And uh, the, the, the British Army had changed the visual system about 10 years before us. We went over there and because we were more, more senior guys, we used to do a thing with the side and everything else. Uh, it was just some of those more old school lessons that we, we had that we could um, actually fly faster and be more active in support of uh, British and coalition troops. Little things like you know, hearing uh, troops in contact and haven't got a call for fly yet, changing Sarah Mark. Towards that, so you only have to move block the you know, Checking charges every half an hour when the temperature and the outstanding rises and falls pretty rapidly, instead of just going for what the band says. Um, all, all these little things that you need to know the principles of the and not just the drill or the technical um, piece of one. So uh, that's what I'm concerned that as we get more technology, those old school principles are starting to wear out as people. In terms of some of those uh, lessons on it, another, another one, the head of Richmond mentioned about the net. Uh, one of the other considerations we're looking at is what we're looking at in uh, particularly to augment that long fires uh, capability that uh, I referred to earlier. So that's another one for any of the one three one one big lot fires and girls that might be in the audience here this evening. Uh, it's interesting about the GPS. Uh, GPS we became very reliant uh, on that type of technology in terms of some of the guidance systems associated with some of these extended range conditions. Uh, we're very mindful of that and uh, we are constantly uh, considering uh, the ramifications of working in a GPS degraded, ever a better GPS denied environment in terms of how that's going to manifest. Uh, in terms of uh, some of those ammunition systems now that rely on that heavily that we've become so used to. Uh, so, yes, it is, it is very much an issue. Uh, I'm not saying we've got all the answers yet, but we're very cognizant of moving forward uh, with those considerations. So it's funny, you get used to it and, and it works really well. You, only, uh, you develop that technology and, and then there's defeat the mechanisms for it. And funny enough, we're going back to uh, or we'll looking for different ways to, to solve um, that kind of issue. I would like to say, as the student people in front of the senior officers, um, <laughs> there was one thing that I would hope and I fully expect to see this today is going on. In 1918, um, you know, Australia sent a, a civilian army over the volunteers and it was sent over, but by 1918 they are very much professionals and they are strongly encouraged to talk with each other and develop their professional ideas amongst each other from platoon commanders with their company commanders all the way through. And then there's the artillery officers, they are deliberately put in positions where they have to hang out with balloonists to make sure that they trust their observation. They are deliberately put in place in tanks so that the infantry get put in these tanks so they trust them and they work with them. And they are encouraged to socialise and discuss ideas with each other as professionals in a professional army and it's massively beneficial in making at all levels and all the different arms. So um, yeah, get on it. So it's out. Yeah. <laughs> it's good checking on my
Mike. Uh, it's a good, it's a really good question, uh, and it's, it's something that we are turning our mind to in a big way. Adam's spoke in his presentation about uh, the individual ways of looking at intelligence and counter-battery uh, fires in, in, in the, in the uh, seminar uh, context. We, we know now. We know now after the last couple of uh, exercises, the big exercises that we've run. Our, the, 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 the biggest factor that slows down our decision making in a contested decision action cycle uh, is the number of sensors that we have coming into one node, normally a headquarters somewhere, and our, our ability to process that view without analyse that and then just decide that subsequently. So next year for the first time, one of the key outcomes from Talent Save will be starting to identify key areas where we are going to start to do things like artificial intelligence, machine learning, where, where, we'll, we'll, where will an army and defence force at our size get the biggest bang for the buck uh, if and when we start inserting that sort of uh, technology to get after it. So uh, we're, we're alive to it. Uh, the wheels do turn pretty slow. I think that's also driving uh, a much different relationship with industry. Uh, ADA has been there for some time. Uh, Gunners also, I think what we're seeing in some of the dome simulators also is starting to see green shoots in relationship with the industry. We know from some of the training that we're seeing, we've reworked with even this now land range safety. Uh, the, 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 the type and nature and sophistication of training delivered by our industry partners could, couldn't be delivered in a decade by, by, by people that we have in uniform. So I think that entire relationship with industry will be asked them to do, how, how we incorporate that innovation we're going to see more and more of it with some of these changes we're seeing coming, coming into the IRB and how we see our operating environment where we know we're weak. I'm going to be a real spoiler and I'm going to have to say that with a little bit of time left in this discussion, I'd like, I would love it to have gone on for another hour and I know we're all places to go. And I asked the two people about uh, what questions do you want to ask them in that because of the involvement of that. I was about to jump on the bandwagon and respond to that a little bit and just give some contemporary uh, information about uh, what, what I'm doing in space. But if I can be able to ask a question, I'll probably... Yeah, quick comment from there and then I'll have to look and then we'll just have to draw the uh, Q&A for the close and sort of, otherwise we won't get this if we've got a really free to be prepared for a week. My name is Major McAllen. I'm uh, an SO2 working on the headquarters and, and my job this year is to be, think about a lot of these issues as Leo and any story would say, history crimes. And it does occur throughout the day about the lessons that we learned back in the First World War and the whole country fire problem involved. Um, there are a lot of parallels I see right now you know, with where things are as Australian artillery as opposed to the other Western Force artillery. We have withdrawn into myself just dealt with technology and the, and the basic problem of, of firing guns. I think we are, we've, we've passed the collection point now where, and you see this through the way the Russians um, have been agreed to come their London artillery. Um, of all the sensors that are out there in the battlefield, the problems have changed in terms of the fact that the, the ranges that we're dealing with are far beyond our ability to organically observe and track them. So we just changed. But some of the things that I would refer to uh, that we need to move and are moving into you know, science consensus, uh, you know, maybe flash, uh, certainly uh, uh, acoustic, uh, weapon locating radar, uh, as an enterprise, as an artillery enterprise, and I'll probably say this a little bit in terms of uh, with respect to the fact that we're not having conferences here, so it's probably one opportunity to do some influence the, the wider crowd. Um, we need to re-specialise again, the comment was made a bit earlier. Uh, we need to embrace that, we need to sell that message. It's too hard to try and be all things to everyone, and we need to re-stream, um, but still maintain that connection as an artillery of the price uh, to deliver a joint effect.
comes from that, I suppose, is that the splinter shield disappeared from the gun. But we adapted it in a way that we'd actually put the splinter shield on the man uh, through body armor. Who I mentioned that in the earlier, and the great uh, thing is the comment made on that was, in the early rotations of the poor man, they didn't wear uh, body armor, but in the later rotations, they did, uh, because there were some casualties originally made through um, splinters.